hybridization of orbitals is something that occurs mostly when an atom is getting ready to bond with another atom. And so you have to be aware of the context in which those bonds are happening in order to truly understand hybridization. The traditional way has often been just to teach you rules about if there are no pi bonds, if there are four single bonds, then it's just sp3 orbitals. If there are different numbers of pi bonds, if there's a double bond, then you start thinking of sp2. But rather than that, I think it's important to understand why hybrid orbitals exist in the way that they do. Essentially, if you have a pi bond being formed, so if you have double bonds or triple bonds, remember that those require an intact p orbital. And so the p orbital must be preserved in that bonding arrangement, and that means that the p orbital doesn't hybridize. And so if you have, for example, a, a double bond that occurs, that p orbital must remain intact. And the remaining orbital clouds, which are going to be the two remaining p's and the s orbital, if we have a, a standard octet, those are the ones that are left over, the s and two p's, those will hybridize into sp2 orbitals. And they're called sp2 because they're one part s orbital and two parts p orbital. Or you might hear it described as them having 33% s character and 66% p character because the shape of the orbital cloud will often look like it's two thirds of a p cloud and one third of an s cloud. And so the bottom line whenever you're thinking about hybridization questions is to figure out how many p orbital clouds do you need to retain and do you need to keep intact and then as soon as you figure out how many p orbitals you will need whatever is left over can hybridize and so if you have no pi bonds necessary if there's no double bonding that's occurring then all of the s and p orbitals can hybridize and so what you get left with is four different sp3 orbitals and that it takes a tetrahedron shape because of the valence shell electron repulsion theory. The tetrahedral shape has angles of 109.5 and that allows all of the electrons in these different bonding groups to be as far from each other as possible. So be very aware, aware of this tetrahedron and also be aware of the fact that it's 109.5 degrees. Now the Overall geometry of it will be tetrahedral whether or not it has lone pairs. But if there are lone pairs, those don't participate in the molecular bonding. And because of that, you might see a term come up called molecular geometry. And that's specifically looking at the geometry of the bonding components. And so if you have one lone pair, then this tetrahedron will instead turn into a trigonal pyramidal shape because it's a triangle with three bases and so it looks like a pyramid and then this lone pair up there removes the top part of that tetrahedron. If you have two lone pairs that means you're eliminating two of the legs of this tetrahedron and all that you're left with is a bent shape and bent can also be known as angular and the angular can have different angles because of the, the valence shell electron pair repulsion geometry. And so, for example, if you have a bent shape that is based in the tetrahedral geometry, then it will have 109.5 degrees between these two bonding pairs. Now, if you do have double bonds, for example, if you have just one double bond, you need to retain one of those p orbitals for the pi bond that you're making. And so that p orbital must stay intact and everything left over turns into hybrid orbitals. And so your s joins with the two remaining p orbitals and you end up with three distinct sp2 orbitals. And they're sp2 because it's made up of two p orbitals and one s orbital. This will have a trigonal planar shape because now rather than becoming a tetrahedron, it becomes planar because that's the easiest way for all those bonds to be oriented. And the trigonal planar geometry has 120 degrees between each of these bonding groups. If one of these two 
bonds is instead replaced by just a lone pair, if it's not participating in bonding, then what you end up with is a bent shape where you have a lone pair replacing this leg and you have the double bond and the single bond. And this one is bent much like a tetrahedron with two lone pairs. But the difference is that this one is bent with 120 degree molecular geometry because it's based on the trigonal planar geometry again due to the fact that you need this p orbital to stay intact. Now in cases where you have two pi bonds and those either occur when you have two double bonds so a double bond on each side of for example a carbon or if you have a triple bond which is something that only occurs with carbon and nitrogen then what you have to do is you need two pi bonds and that means you need two of the p orbitals to stay intact. And so those do not participate in hybridization. And all that's left over is one of the, the s orbital and one of the p orbitals. And so those hybridize into two distinct sp orbitals. So rather than just remembering the rules, it's more important to be able to realize that as soon as you figure out how many p orbital clouds you need, anything else will hybridize. And so what you're left with here is two sp orbitals because two of the p orbitals that were originally there are now being occupied by these pi bonds. And notice that this forms a linear geometry, whether it is two double bonds or whether it's a triple bond and a single bond. Those will have 180 degrees of separation because that is the furthest distance that these groups can be from each other. And it's unlikely that you'll see one of these with uh, lone pairs. I suppose it's possible that you can have a lone pair replacing this sing single bond there. And in that case, it would be linear. But you're unlikely to be asked questions on the molecular geometry of something that involves sp hybridization. And so remember that rather than just memorizing a list of all the different orbital types that correspond with different bonding motifs, it's far better to just realize that you only need to keep these p orbital clouds intact if they are participating in pi bonding with one of their neighbors. So you only keep p orbitals intact if there's double bonding or triple bonding going on. Other than that, all of the clouds in that valence shell will hybridize and the hybridization pattern will be based on whatever orbital clouds are participating in this. And so here with, uh, with no pi bonds whatsoever, you have the S and all three of the P orbital clouds. And so that will end up being SP3 orbitals and taking this tetrahedral shape. And uh, if you do have a single pi bond, so there's, there's a, a double bond in there, then you need to keep one of those P orbital clouds intact and the rest will hybridize. And the same applies in any case where you have two double bonds or if you have a triple bond. You need those p orbitals to stay intact and then whatever orbital clouds are remaining, those are going to hybridize. And so I think as long as you understand that rule, then you should be very strong if orbital hybridization questions show up on your MCAT.